about, uh, I mean, this expressive poem and uh, the other one, the more contemporary poem about Azadi. So, uh, what do you think of the use of other language words and uh, how do you feel about that? Is it uh, some discomfort today? Do you think should be advocated? Should be. What do you mean by other language words? I mean, in English poetry, uh, using words like from Azadi other. Or just long words. Yeah, I think also because I couldn't see it properly, I misread them. But, you know, I've read this poem better in other places, and I apologize for the fumbling. Um, I'm comfortable using uh, whatever comes to me organically. And I have used words from Bangla, from Assamese, from Hindi, Urdu, Hindustani. Uh, I've used uh, even words which are gibberish. Uh, and I feel, you know, I have the advantage of multilingualism, and somehow it's not odd for me to uh, weave in a word which, and I don't need to supply the meaning for it whenever I'm doing it. And I think if you feel very strongly about it, you can simply uh, weave in any word that uh, you feel is suitable to your context, to the character, or to the theme, or to the music that it might lend. So uh, when I'm writing in this poem, uh, Paris was, moi je, je suis de Panam. Apparently Paris was in olden times called Panam. For there's some history about it, which I'm not able to recollect, but Paris has a rich, uh, I mean, France has a rich history of also being the hub of knowledge and culture and arts and letters and everybody would flock in there just to be sophisticated enough. You know, like um, in, the, in the European courts, uh, French would be the language of sophistication. And if it was like in Germany, they would speak German only to the dogs and horses. I heard something like that being told to me. So um, in any case, so whenever you are in a particular space, in a, in a certain linguistic context, if you feel you have more nuance and more cadence and more uh, layers adding in that particular word from other language than English, I would think it would be put, uh, perfectly okay. The Balimara poem which I read, I mean, I felt absolutely fine saying, um, you, uh, Alvida, you said, adding in English, so long. I mean, I did translate it as so long, but I thought that was only to keep the rhythm of the line that I, Alvida, you said, adding in English, so long. So it's also uh, a juxtaposition of what Ghalib or the tradition that he bears for us from his context back in the days to what we see him or see that tradition in our contemporary times. So it's, I'm also trying to just put two things together here. So the poem is using words like Alvida, and um, trying to get away with this because it's, it's sort of a bye-bye to the past, goodbye to Balimara. It's uh, so long, but in so long, I'm trying to imply that there would be another meeting. There would be another comeback. And there is comeback because for me, I mean, personally, Ghalib lives on not just as a lyrical poet, but <laughs> as somebody who is my political tool, somebody I can you know use for protest, for uh, for uh, expressing my anguish and the crisis that, that's around us. We could probably find voice and we could retell uh, things that have been told. So using your Urdu, Hindustani, Hindi, or you know, words from Bangla, Badar Badar Ghazi Ghazi is seemingly Urdu, Hindustani. There is a Persian Arabic root to those words, but these are actually sung by ordinary Bangladesh boatmen or when Bangladesh was not Bangladesh, when it was just Bengal. I mean, there are stories of how they would go actually do worships to the goddess of the forest called Ban Bivi. Ban means forest, and Bivi is the goddess, the lady of the forest. So they would actually pray and worship, even though they were Muslims by faith, and then pray to Baremia, which is actually the tiger, who is also the lord of the forest. So the tiger is the Baremia, and the, the goddess is Ban Bivi, and when they row their boat, they want everybody to be safe and the weather to be fine and no harms, uh, nobody coming harm's way. So Badar Badar Ghazi Ghazi is evoking to uh, saints, local saints in that manner. And I thought it was perfectly all right to fit it in with uh, 
the accumulation, the rate thing. I mean, I don't know if this answers it. But I'm, I'm comfortable doing it. And I think everybody should feel, if you feel this is bringing out your message, your, your, in, your emotions in a particular poem, you should do it. I mean, why should I translate azadi as freedom? It is freedom, right? So I know, I mean, there is too much azadi going on, but that shouldn't deter me from writing what I write. I, mean, I could also call it freedom cry and then write a different poem altogether, which would be perfect. We could all do that, right? Any other question? Shall I read some prose? So I'm going to read a little bit from my first book, um, Footprints in the Bajra, and uh, I hope it's, it's from a section called uh, Sheherwali, Visit to Durjanpur. Just to give you a quick background about the book. So there are two women, sort of two protagonists, and this is one is main, other is secondary. So the younger one is called Muskan. Muskan means smile in Hindi. The story is set in North Bihar, which was actually the hub of Maoism in its nascent times when Maoism was starting to show up its head and you know there were scattered reports of skirmishes and you know, attacks and all that. But this is like uh, set much uh, back in time. And Durjanpur is also a name which signifies the abode of bad people because Durjan means bad in Hindi, Pur is Pur, so Rampur, Haripur, you know. So Muskan's other name is, um, uh, sorry, Muskan meets a girl from the cities who acts as a foil to her character. So this woman from the cities is a theater activist and her name is, in most parts, referred to as Sheherwali. You know what is Sheher? It means city and Sheherwali is you know, somebody who's from the city. So Muskan keeps calling this woman Sheherwali in a mock serious tone. She keeps taunting her. That you are a city girl, you're a Sheherwali. This section is called Sheherwali, Sheherwali Visit to Durjanpur. If you misrepresent them, they'll abduct and kill you, says Muskan, our hostess, and swats my attention as though it were a distracted fly bumbling over a new order. All the while, she keenly observes my face as if I'm wearing a mask to cover up my reaction. In reality, I try to peer at myself in a small mirror in the wall, on the wall. I'm unsettled by jagged murals of tigers and hunters staring at me from that rough surface of the wall, and I wipe my coal in the gradually failing evening light. She brings in a kerosene lantern and hovers over it. Kerosene lantern? I thought we entered a new bright millennium, but I knew, but I knew it while coming to this village. Durjanpur is a world of darkness and shadows that jostle in the slightest light. Muskan notices my facial reaction, gives a sharp tug on the glass chimney. The perked up wick turns her into a luminous paper lantern, the yellow attired form quivering. My mind, the fly flits, smarting from the flame. Abduct me? Yeah, maybe not rape. They don't believe in rapes. Abduct, yes. Kill, certainly. Her voice is lispy, childlike. She's probably only a teenager, yet she speaks of such dangerous things that makes me uncomfortable. How do you know what they believe or not believe? Muskan avoids my question. We are discussing our play that we brought from the city to this remote Bihar village and about Maoists. It's believed they are all around, permeating every shred of the tattered fabric of this feudal Indian society. Some accuse us of being sympathetic to those rebels in our play. We believe we are fair to all. Muskan, meanwhile, warns me about Maoists, how they can straighten up city whims. I'm so creeped out now that I can't tell her how much I wanted to visit those remote areas. Graduation over our campus theater group, it is called Campus Theater. Had this plan for a long time. Besides, this is a once in a lifetime thing. How much can one convince students used to renting in cafes, bookshops, and campus plazas? I mean, we needed to be at the right place, hopefully at the right time. My discomfort has my ears cocked to sounds and movements I would usually never catch. 
Outside the window, snippety bands of crickets assemble, sound testing their voices in intermittent croaks. Some few meters away, acres and acres of bajra, taller than my five foot one frame sway, as if somebody hiding in there was moving slowly sideways and crawling. Used to slow bleeding sunsets strung on city lampposts, I watch another evening, a mute sea of green, ochre, and red, where any single movement embodies all possible sounds, a blade of grass moving, a nameless bird nesting, an insect crawling atop the ear of the crop, a grain of pollen floating in the breeze, and the scarlet sun getting a wash job at the day's end. We watch together, the evening slowly purpling, a glorious flower withered and shriveled from the day's brazen heat. Sherwali, Muskan utters, sounding part disdainful, part in admiration, summing me up in that, in that name. She lives in this village, a mere hundred house settlement. Tonight you get bajra breads to eat and yogurt. That's it, she announces. Don't miss your city fair. I shrug in submission. I befriended this young woman only since the day as we arrived from Patna. The government circuit house was our first day stop from where a bumpy long jeep ride brought us to Durjanpur. The name made me smile, bad people's abode, Durjanpur. She, Muskan, came to our first show at the village Mandap, a place for prayer congregations, social meetings, and even civic affairs, where the sacred Tulsi plant stood in a prayerful posture on a vermilion plastered concrete pedestal. First time we had Muslims actually enter the mandap. It's a first time, said Surya Khan Sahai, the local headmaster and community leader after our show. It's on his invitation that we came to this godforsaken village. What we couldn't do in decades, this theater group from the big city did in an hour. He smiles, shaking his gray beard. I try to understand if that was said in encouragement. In a village like this, I would imagine everyone to be a little holed up, the way newspapers reported, cocooned in their little worlds, a Muslim world, an upper caste world, a Brahmin world. Muskan had tugged at my dupatta, the long scarf I was supposed to wrap around my upper body, respectively enough. You'll be in the villages, small villages. The gape at women there, especially the ones wearing jeans and shirt, are just from outside the planet. Don't at least let your, let your dupatta sleep, slip, sorry. Don't at least let your dupatta slip. I was warned before we came here. The tug made me turn back. I'd expected a potential sexual harassment and sewing, and instead saw the young girl, dark as this Tulsi plant, long braided and small built, with eyes like overbaked pottery shards, both sharp and brown. You look funny wearing a dupatta over your shirt, she made her point, candid. It's because of you, your men, who would only have women make bajra breads at home, I wanted to say. But I just smiled back, invited to stay in the village. We had only too gratefully accepted the headmaster's offer. Later, as Muskan comes into the room where I am to sleep, she looks around while I keep examining the intimidating mur mural on the wall. She sits down on a little stool and stares through the open window. Sheherwali, her voice exudes mild banter. Can you sleep alone here? Yeah, I'm a Sherwali, a city woman, but why can't I? Look, my name is Nora. I already told you, call me that, not Sherwali. She ignores that and points to the window. The Bajra fields often scare folks, she said, says, with its undulation, peculiar sounds, and phantom shadows of moving images. The Maoists come and go, she yawns. Everyone knows. Some morning you may find a dead body or a discarded gun in there. Muskan gets busy observing the ceiling in the lantern light. Our shadows caught in the cobweb above bounce and bob. That's when I take notice of the bajra crop outside. Yes, I'm right. The plants are as tall as I am, some a bit taller. Slender stalks with multiple limbs, ribbon-like leaves that quiver in the evening air and adore the topmost spear of the plant that is not yet golden or brown with grains. With dusk still in hiding, they flash the dark greenness across an immeasurable expanse. They heave strangely, or so I think. Before I even wipe away my extra dark coal for the last role I played in our street play, Muskan rolls the tail end of her long braid around her little finger and com comments about our play. She fancies the storyline and the folk songs associated with it, but she warns me that we are in a sensitive area in northern Indian badlands. Durjanpur has been in news for some wrong reasons. I'll sleep on a mat here. You won't feel a thing. Muskan thumps on the floor with her back to me while I change into my pajamas. 
Dinner over, she rolls on the mat like a phosphorescent field mouse, her yellow clothes. She wears the traditional silver kameez, reflecting the night's light from the window. Her long braid stands out in her thin and small frame like a giant tail. There is no electricity here, hence no question of shutting the window on a warm night. What if a thief comes in, or a robber, or even a stalker? Share Wali, she giggles, laced with irritation. Go to sleep. This isn't like your cities, not here. Yes, there are robbers here. Those are traders and landowners, and they rob you day or night, even if you lock yourself up. The window without bars or grills menace me. How, menaces me. How do you feel safe then? I fidget in bed. <coughs> we sleep or else we talk. If you are not sleepy, we will talk. So, you know, I'm going to skip some more, and then they have a conversation, and just the very end of it is... The rains are coming. Muskan twists on the mat like a glowworm, her arms and legs stuck close to her slight body, giving it a cylindrical appearance. Tomorrow you have an afternoon show at the school ground. I need to be up early to crush the wheat so the flour gets kneaded in time before lunch. She rolls over, turns down the lantern flame, and seems to fall asleep immediately. I blink on for a while and then close my eyes. It doesn't rain a drop in the next few hours. That's all from this book. Uh, do we have time for more pros? Do, do you want to ask me something about this part before I can go on to anything else? About the portion from the novel that I read out? I'm oh. not sure how we are for time. If we might have class after this. What's the time? I are we good for time? Yeah, it's okay. Because be nice we're going to follow up with the workshop and look as well. Yeah, so should I just continue reading a little more from... Okay, so this will be the last bit of uh, prose I'll read. And then please feel free to ask me any questions. So, I mean, I might not have answers for all of it, but <laughs> like, this is a story from my uh, short fiction collection, The House of Twining Roses. The story is called Atif's World. It's a character called Atif who was born and brought up by a Hindu foster father because Atif was, I, I think he was an orphan. That's how it. Uh, how I created him. Atif's world. People say India has changed. Shitload of money flying around. BPOs, outsourcing, words I didn't completely understand. But I think changing time should be measured in terms of deeper things. I don't know how to convince you. If you know justice, not the kind Mahatma Gandhi talked about, but my kind. The kind my former employers envisioned in the village of Amrawa in Bihar and got away. This is also in Bihar. I have no qualms in saying quite a bit in my life went wrong because, only because I took this notion of justice very seriously. This is why I'm here today at the police station giving the statement. Let me make it clear. The work I did before coming to Patna was quite interesting as well as risky. My employers, landowners and moneylenders of Amrawa had made it clear as to what I was supposed to do, all in the name of justice, while they sat in their mansions and lending shops. You want to know about me? I, Atif, was born and brought up in Amrawa by a childless widower and bonded laborer called Dindayal Mahato. Surprise? I mean, not about the mention of bonded laborer, the fact that my foster parent was Hindu while I'm named Atif. Well, wonders are many, our only village schoolmaster Ratanpal used to say. So the story is that when Dindayal, my illiterate Bapuji, found me at a weekly heart, a child of two, abandoned and wailing, he brought me home. I had a tattoo on my left forearm. Bapuji's friend Ratanpal said the word because he could read both Hindi and Urdu. He said it was Atif. That's his name, Dindayal, the schoolmaster told him. Bapuji thought I might do something better than become a laborer like him. So I went to read and write at Ratanpal's school for free, although in the beginning, Amrawa's elites objected to that. Apparently, Ratanpal made it clear that he'd be forced to resign if there was any high-handedness. Okay, master, only this one time, the elites warned him. You see, both the parties needed each other. The Amrawa elites needed a literate man to maintain certain image of the village. Master G needed the school to survive. However, the big people made it amply clear that even though I wouldn't become a bonded farm laborer, I would be bonded to the influential men of Amrawa in some way or the other. When Bapuji passed away in the year 2000, I was recruited as a special operative of the village landowners and moneylenders. 
It is in Din Dayal's pious memory that we are not harassing you, they said. Otherwise, to live in a Hindu village wouldn't be in your interest anymore. So I bowed to them. I became a henchman at 18 and continued till I was 24 and fed up. Basically, my job was to go after my employer's opponents and straighten them up. In doing so, I might have broken a few ribs, but got away with it. I had protection. No police or media could touch me. Whenever police sirens sounded or TV wallas arrived in Amrava, glasses of cool sharbat and sweets were passed around in the sitting rooms of the big people where most investigations or interviews took place. I was a nobody. No one knew Atif's whereabouts. Atif wasn't involved. And anyway, I never killed or raped, so nothing serious in whatever I did. If, in the beginning, I had scruples about my work, I was made to understand that I was doing business in favor of powers that be. Nothing wrong in it. Stifling my benefactor's opposition, extracting money long overdue, ransacking shops or homes, physically intimidating detractors, all that constituted my job profile. Besides, what could a secondary school educated man with a name like Atif do when he knew his roti pani would come only from serving the Takurs and Pandits? Maya, all is Maya, Takur Bhim Singh would tell me after he took his daily evening dose of opium with the hookah he smoked, referring to my weaknesses. I knew what Maya meant, the world, an illusion. Ratan Pal said that too, but he was wise. I was learning to become wise as well. Atif's world couldn't be so bleak after all. Take, for instance, that incident when Burelal, the moneylender, was yelled at by Ram Sevak, the farmer. Ram Sevak was one of the handful to till his independent plot of land. He hadn't sold off his farmland despite coaxing by the brothers Bhim Singh and Bhushan Singh, and instead borrowed money from Bure to meet the costs of his bullocks and their fodder. Although he had promised, Ram Sevak couldn't return the money on time, and Bure never waited or granted an extension. So when he summoned Ram Sevak and rebuked him for, him for defaulting, the scrawny farmer went mad and started screaming things like he had a daughter to marry and a sick wife to look after. After the peasant left, Bure called me and imparted clear instructions as to how this Ram Sevak should be taught manners. The next day, Ram Sevak's ready crop was slashed down and burnt, his bullocks let loose, and his family issued a warning and menacing words, especially the fact that his 16-year-old daughter be watched while attending fields in the afternoon or in or the evening school. In my wisdom, I didn't want to see the girl come to any harm. Bure knew that. Just scare her, Atif, he advised me. You don't have to rape her. I'll get someone else if that's needed. Bure knew I was in love with the schoolmaster's daughter, Mira, two years younger to me. They joked about it. As time passed and I gained respect and fear in my henchman's role, both Mira and Ratanpal started giving up on me. Mira was a very smart woman, just like her father. She too taught at her father's school. Although she grew up playing together as, although we grew up playing together as kids, she barely threw a glance at me later. On one occasion, when I had the gall to face her and mumble, Mira, can I say something to you? She raised the dark, flashy eyes and said, you should be ashamed, Atif. Did Baba educate you to become this? And if Chachu were alive today, he'd die of remorse. Chachu was my foster father, Dindayal Mahato. She knew I adored her, but she'd never give me a chance. The more she avoided me, the more involved I became in the nasty game, game plans of Bure, Bhim Singh, and other big wigs of Amrawa. They understood my worth, paid me money, and spoke to me with respect. Meanwhile, I kept hoping for Mira's favors, but things went from bad to worse, and my dream about Mira got shattered like a cheap tea shop glass. I didn't think Mira was Maya or illusion, rather all flesh and blood. She wasn't pretty, really. She had her nose and ears in the right place, but she had large, dark eyes, the shape of catfish seen in the village ponds, and she moved like a fish, too, gently swaying. Her skin was sweet brown like the hearth, but the tip of her fingers, nose, and her heels sometimes turned a tinge of pink when she was angry or happy. Heels, I say, because whenever I went visiting the schoolmaster, like an obedient servant, I sat on the floor of the veranda when she came out with tea and went in. I stole glances at her bare feet and saw the heels change color. She was angry I visited them. Angry, her father loved me, but I wanted Mira for real. I was gradually even getting ready to do whatever she might ask of me. I sought to change. This didn't mean I was thinking of ratting out Bure Lal Bhim and Bhushan Singh brothers, or the priest Narayan Pandit and the rest of their flock. 
I'd slowly wane out of this life I led, out of this artist's world I created around me. Every day I heard of people setting out to Bombay, Delhi, Chandigarh, Bangalore. They found decent jobs there, a life there. I could do that, start afresh. The schoolmaster would be happy to see me change. And he too knew my feelings for Meera. It, it didn't bother him. I was from a different faith or that a low-caste Hindu bonded laborer brought me up. A staunch believer in Gandhi's idols, all were equal to Ratan Paul's eyes. Only if Meera would be kind to me. That just didn't work out, especially when I approached her for the nth time with a lump in my throat. This after I finished a major operation, this time on behalf of Kesar Singh, who owned most of the croplands in Amrava and also ran a grocery business in the neighboring village of Sonipur. So what happens is he just messes up one um, uh, particular assignment. And uh, so the assignment goes bad, Mira gives up. So I'm just going to read the last part. Now the problem was that there's somebody called Gaurav Chetri who had to be taught a lesson. And Gaurav Chetri, as the name says, is a Nepalese guy. So because it's a, you know, border, border is fluid in Bihar and Nepal. People come and go, do their business. The problem was Kesar, who assigned the job to me, has never seen, had never seen Gaurav Chetri in person. When I was called in, I was given the description of a 50-year-old, clean-shaven ne Nepali man, fair complexion, portly built with a balding head. A special marker, I was told, was a gold pen and Chetri was... Uh, Chetri wore around his neck. A talisman in the shape of Lord Shiva's head, according to informers. So when I grab him by the collar, I'll have him identified by this talisman, and then proceed with a sound beating. Also break a few things in his shop. I did exactly those things, and only a day later, Kesar spy came back to tell us that I'd beaten up Chetri's brother-in-law. He was substituting for Chetri that night. Chetri filed a police report with the help of an NGO that worked in Sonpur to restore human rights and stuff like that. Goddamn Nepalese. Kesar swore, slippery bastards. Narayan Pandit tried rationalizing. Still, you got his skin, Atif. Why worry? Justice nonetheless, eh, Kesar? Gurela asked thoughtfully. Did you miss the Shiva talisman, Atif? Of course not. I wasn't operating in total dark. My face was covered while I had a strong flashlight over Chetri's face before starting. Does he even know what a Shiva head looks like? Bure looked, Bure looked at me. Come on, Bure Lal, Kesar waved impatiently. Atif has grown up in Amrava in Dindayal's home. Taught by Ratan Pal, he knows Shiva and all that. Then he swore again, God damn Nepal Nepalis. Do all of them have to wear a Shiva talisman? Sister fuckers. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. I can take a few questions and then I think there is a workshop plan. I, I do write about Assam. In fact, although I read both excerpts, uh, this book is set in Bihar, not Bihar, and the story is also. But in this uh, short story collection, there are stories which are set in Assam, particularly in the period of uh, you know the late 70s when the uh, students. There was a long Asu. students movement, yeah, Assu led movement that started. History, yeah, yeah. I, are you familiar with it? Yes. Yeah. So I have uh, allusions to those times in at least a uh, couple of stories here. And uh, I, I talk about those times when you know, p children would go to school and school would be closed for months together. And a uh, lot of anxiety pervaded the society. And you know, there was suddenly this, um, I mean, of course, the, as a Bengali in Assam, a lot of my own family would say they felt discriminated, but uh, I have, Somehow, I have not really exactly felt that, that myself. So uh, a third generation Bengali, because my grandfather used to work under the um, government of Assam, and when Assam and Silet and Meghalaya were all together. Did you speak partition? No, the, yeah, I mean, he, he was, yeah. They were all partition generation when partition of uh, Bangladesh happened in 1971. So that's a very recent thing. But before that, there was another division of Bengal and East Bengal and when it became East Pakistan later on, right? 
So what I write about is typically about the times when Assam movement was taking over people's lives and especially younger people were affected because when you grow up studying together in a school or a college and apparently even if you know there is the other, there is somebody who's different uh, of different cultural habits, linguistic habits, um, or cultural different context, but you really don't exercise that difference in a manner to shut off the other. But during the students' movement, all of a sudden those walls started coming up. And I have referred to um, at least two stories. I'm not going to prolong this time by reading, but you know, if you manage to get hold of the book, it's available on Amazon in and elsewhere. So there are stories. I, I do write about Assam. And a lot of my poetry, like there are, um, there are stories Folk, folk tales that I employ into render, retell as poems. So there is a character called Tejimola in one of the very popular Asmi stories. Tejimola is again another um, of woman, an embodiment where she's killed several times and she comes alive several times according to the story. She is um, crushed in the mortar and then she is drowned and then she's put dug under the, and buried under the earth, but she, every time she comes back either as a flower or a fruit or a vine. So I have put that stuff in my poem to show how empowerment for, you know, the feminine empowerment that we talk about, how it can be regenerated, resuscitated, and, you know, recaptured in, um, in verse, in, in poetry, and in rhythm that, you know, lends to the essence of the Folk tales. So, yeah, there is a lot of Assam in my work, definitely. <laughs> but uh, I, I straddle uh, like many universes <laughs> right now, and um, so somehow uh, Assam and Bengal it just comes together. Yeah. I primarily write poetry and um, uh, fiction. I started writing because, I mean, although I write poetry and call myself, introduce myself as a poet first, if, if I'm allowed to call myself a poet, um, I somehow feel reading very good fiction is almost as exhilarating as reading good poetry or somehow while reading good fiction, fiction which has intensity in plot, characterization, and its dramatic moments, uh, it lends very beautifully to understanding poetry as well. Because although, you know, you would say, I mean, one can write long, long poems too, very, very long poems. There are a tradition of epic poems and long poems. And those are nothing but also storytelling. I mean, we have the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, which are nothing but story and verse together, fused together. That's a very easy uh, reference that we can uh, look at. So what future holds for me, I have no idea, but I have my third manuscript, which is being circulated uh, a little bit so that I can get it published. And I'm also writing some fiction, again, which is pertaining to Assam, and also uh, which focuses on not just the um, ASU, but you know the Alpha Times, you know, the United Liberation Front of Assam, which was an uber-nationalistic group that started. And, you know, first it captured people's imagination and sentiment that, wow, there is somebody speaking about us as me, but soon it turned into a very murderous force that it was killing innocent civilians, abducting and extorting money from people. And uh, uber-nationalism in that form, just to say I'm breaking away from the rest of India and doing my own, you know, blood act, it doesn't make sense, right? Like, so people were fed up with it. So this new fiction that I'm writing is actually, I don't know how much I'll, I really want to do it. It's, it's a woman again, who's the central character. She's a sleuth. She's a, she's a, um, uh, what do you say, a secret agent. In the sense, she's actually speaking from that time when she's retired. She's um, voluntarily retired, but she's speaking about her past when she was almost like a swashbuckling, secret agent employed by the topmost uh, agency in the country and the Assam government. And she actually goes out in uh, out for errands and assignments where she encounters um, ultra, ultras or 
terrorists or whatever they're called, you know, different, different terms, militants, and uh, how she, as a woman, you know, looks at this world. So because there are a lot of male spies and sleuths and male secret agents, and uh, you can give tons and tons of uh, examples, but for me, she'll be a voice which is, you know, not just looking at the hot chase, so to say, you know, in movie terms, but also how a woman's place works out in a world where most of gun running, killing, revenge, retribution, and all this state act of, you know, secret killings and abduction and all that, it's mostly a male dominion, right? It's somewhere, you know, you get very few female uh, women, women coming up, beginning. So um, I'm trying to place this uh, and I have roughly written three uh, chapters. They're not yet fully chapters, but I think I'm going to add to it. So just to give you a glimpse of what I'm doing. Yeah, but I, I like writing poetry and I mostly, you know, think of uh, things in poetry, I think. But I really love reading good fiction and especially short stories. And this probably is a habit I inculcated as a school kid when we were made to read O. Henry and Mopasa and, you know, the usual canonical writers, but I think it did me good in some way because you, you learn so much from their economy of words, their tight grip on plots, so especially characterization. Picture the poetic world that we have put in the Bible in front of us. So the poetic thing you must you know, always be there when you're writing fiction. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Batra, I've been told this before as well, that some portions in Bajra are pretty much you know, poetic in their description. Um, and in fact, someone com commented after reading the book that first, there is like a, you can feel there's a first half and a second half. They said the first half is more uh, poetic in the sense, the way it goes lyrical, et cetera. And the second half goes like, it just goes, you know, cut, cut, cut on the action, you know? So I, I'm not sure I did it in a fractured way, but if it has happened, it has happened, right? So I'm not going to defend myself by saying why I did and, you know, should I have done something else? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, yeah, the first half, uh, because it's also uh, from the viewpoint of um, Sheherwali, who the city, uh, who's the city girl. Each of the chapters are first person voices. So there's cha chapter one, which is uh, like, there's one chapter from Muskan, and it's all first person narrative. The, there's another chapter, which is Sheherwali, it's first person. So it's all different personas and different voices. Each chapter is different. Then there are male characters, like the headmaster Sahai. Then there is a, there is a very um, impressive young man called Abdud, <laughs> who is actually a businessman, but he turns a Maoist from, from a um, uh, moderately successful businessman, middle class, well-to-do. He turns into a Maoist operative. Why? So I felt rather than have an authorial voice tell the story, I would have Avdud tell his story. So the Avdud chapter will actually say what he used to do, where he traveled, what he did for his business, how he became a um, Maoist rebel, so to say, how he started supporting this cause. So, so all, for all that, I took the aid of first person narrative and just spoke from their, their heads, from their voice. So there are you know, different men and women speaking. Headmaster is an older man. He's like a typical village schoolmaster who is well-versed in Shakespeare. So there are Shakespeare quotes in throughout his na narration when he says whether he is killing somebody or ordering an, uh, ordering an operation. Or, and because he's the headmaster, he doesn't really dirty his hands. He has other people do the job for him. But he's the, he's the mentor. He's the moral guide. He's the knowledgeable one. And he's quoting Shakespeare, Macbeth, and all those, you know, Tempest. And he, he's justifying his cause. So it's interesting to see, probably, like, if you can read this book, uh, how uh, I actually want to do that. So some of it is poetic because Nora's, um, in Nora's head, the Bajra, the new uh, scenario in the village, the mud houses, everything is so different. Where she's a foreigner to this. She's really a city person. She's arrived from Delhi. And she's like eating bajra bread. She doesn't even know how to scoop it up. You know, I mean bajra roti and bread and all that. Uh, so I try to create a, a world where she's almost looking in awe at things and feeling of the, her feeling that there would be people with guns inside this bajra fields. There's a lot of killing later on in this. There's a, there's a scene where there's a 
a big operation where they are doing their play in an open field. And then the landlord's army, which I kind of like thought Ranveer Sena, if you are familiar with an old, uh, Ranveer Sena used to be, uh, yeah, the landlord's army. It's an army which was, was the, they would come and attack villages, kill Dalits and uh, uh, Muslims and the underprivileged and generally poor people and uh, just kill women, rape women, abduct them, whatever. So there is a landlord's army that comes and starts disrupting the play. And so this was actually set up. So during that scene, um, so Abdut and she, um, Muskan, they all actually go back to the Bajra field and they actually kill an influential zamindar's son. So that killing is a very cinematic or dramatic, I wouldn't call it cinematic because cinema for me and is something else. It's a very dramatic uh, moment in this book. But there is some poetic license that I take, you know, to even describe blood and how when running away from the scene, uh, Muskan is tugging at Shahrawal's hand, run with me or else police will come because the landlords have already informed the police. And while running, they stumble and fall on blood and what does blood feel like when you fall, fall down in mushy, uh, dark field, pitch dark, you can't see a thing. And uh, how the Bajra is scratching her body, her hands and face, and the blood and the mud gets into her face and it's salty, it's muddy, it's, is it like food, is it something else? So all that sensation, maybe I've taken a bit of poetic license to you know, describe it. To write my poetry or read? I write mainly in English. I have written in Bengali and Assamese too, but those were uh, sort of early writing. And uh, after that, um, I sort of seamlessly um, went over to write in English and I didn't feel any problem doing it. Because I also, while I, while I wrote in English, I created my own diction, I created a register and I just thought it was perfectly fine because um, my comfort level was okay, if you want to know. So, and uh, even if there was, you know, I'm a student of linguistics. I mean, in the past I was. So there's something called language interference. Uh, linguists use it to say there, when you are multilingual, you're speaking in English, but you're thinking in maybe two other languages, which I find very normal and ab absolutely acceptable. So uh, I could actually transfer them back in my stories. So when I'm reading out if you know, I, when I read that last part, I felt the abuses he uses, uh, or the bure and kesar use, maybe not, uh, maybe call, the, put the real Hindi words in it, or, but then I just felt it's absolutely okay to use bastard and sister fucker and get away. I mean, in Bihar, it's pretty common. People address each, each other as uh, ben chod, beti chod. I'm sorry, okay? But they do it. I've, I've actually been among people who are doing their daily stuff and they're calling each other endearingly. But you don't call them that. I mean, if I use that for them, it becomes an abuse. But two people endearingly uh, calling each other names and when they are familiar with their own universe, it's perfectly okay. So that's, that's why I sort of, but I didn't translate it. I just thought it's okay to leave it there. So it's, it's uh, you know, writing in Bangla and Asmis is more or less now limited to translation that I'm doing. So I sometimes translate my own work or translate from Asmis to English or Bangla to English, um, as and when I feel interested and inspired. Yeah, thank you. And the context for those uh, the words that you mentioned, the word Bijabi, and hearing in one mm -hmm. language, and do you think that there's an ethical problem when you, uh, when that same word is endearing in one language, and if you translate it into English, Because the English reader may not know that it is really an English mm -hmm. word, and they could interpret as uh, something very negative, which is which actually it's not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I seriously don't know uh, how. I mean, when I read, I have no idea how readers perceived it. Did you perceive it as 
sort of normal to the conversation, to the characters? And did you find it was? It's the Sony Pat thing, that, and that's why I was asking about this one beloved thing. Because, you know, like in, in, in Hindi or Haryanvi, like the use of the word beloved between two men would be like, like French, you know, like yaar, like hmm. that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas in English, beloved sounds different. I mean, that's why yeah. I was also asking yeah. that question. Yeah, I think uh, to answer your question and then also uh, refer to yours, I'm not sure if uh, English reading public uh, will take this graciously or happily, but I'm expecting, because I'm writing about rural characters like this Kesar Singh and Burshan and Burelal, who are rustic, strong, powerful men and men who dictate and also oppress, you know, men who tell the terms. So for them to use abuses among themselves or even to call others, and here it's like they're hurling the abuse at a Nepalese guy, right? Like, you know, why do they all wear Shiva talisman? Like, you know, why the f they have to do that? <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that if one reads the story in that context um, and in relation to the characters, uh, this will become somewhat clear, if not amply clear, that uh, these abuses, or not just abuses, any typical word that uh, comes across, you know, in, a, in daily parlance, it, it would be accepted as, you know, what they normally use. And I think translation always doesn't help, but sometimes you feel it's okay to leave it in English. Sometimes you feel you need to say it in um, Hindi or whatever other language you are trying to transcreate, you know? So I, I think it's, you're completely, if you're a writer, I think you're completely guided by your sense of that space and time where you know this character is speaking and you want to see that person, how would he or she speak? You know, how would, I mean, like the, I just told Dr. Batra that I'm writing about a female sleuth or secret agent. Um, she's used to a lot of rough times and she also uses harsh languages. How do I, but she's writing from a point in time where she is like, slightly elderly and she's looking back at her own um, exploits and escapades. So how would she use those harsh expressions or uh, gallies, like you say, or how would she encounter um, 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 an opponent? Uh, but I think it all should come when you, are, when you are comfortable with the character, when you know where your story is going, and when you know that things must just, must just you know, weave together to give you the flavor of that particular moment. So, I mean, uh, besides that, I can't tell much because I would rely on my readers to come back and tell me, why did you use that abuse? You know, it's probably not proper, but proper and improper is probably not the criteria we should draw. So that, that really doesn't count here. Yeah. Even in English writing, words that you heard in the context of an interrogation, it's not something Yeah, I mean, I held a class just about four letter words, the F word, and one class was dedicated to just that because a lot of people speak like that, and sometimes probably I have spoken like that, so why not address it in a creative writing class? How do you see a four letter word useful for the narrative that you're trying to create? And then there's a very well-known poem, and I don't know if I can, uh, I don't have internet here, but there's a, uh, there's a poem which actually discuss the word fuck, as in making love, or is it an abuse? So here the teacher is saying, I gave an assignment to the class to uh, write about lovemaking. And one girl uh, wrote, we were fucking against the gym wall, or something like that. We were standing against the gym wall. So everybody rose up in uproar saying, that's improper, that's not decorum, you don't use those words, and where is the essence of love in such a crass word? It is such a crass word that you can't really get any essence of love. So either you are consumed by the idea that love should be only a very sacred, private moment, and nothing that adheres to swear words or abuse words, or you are fluid about the fact, you are, you are absolutely f fine about the fact that Sometimes love and F word can come together in a moment of passion or frenzy, which is perfect, which is okay. 
and not every time it's an indecent word or improper word. So I wish I had the poem here, or if someone could, um, I mean, forget it, and let's not read it. But it's a, it's a poem that actually goes through different people's reactions in usage of this word, and at the end, the teacher says, let's hear the person who wrote the word, and she becomes, she's a very shy person, and the poet, she gets teary-eyed, and she says, but I thought it was fuck. No, but I was making love, something like that. And she says it very dismissively, very shyly. And probably that's the cue here, when a person has felt it is important to her writing. But at the same time, I think I also tell my students that a liberal use of F words or you know, abuse is not going to get you anywhere because you're not really conveying any content unless you create the content. I mean, if you don't create a particular statement what your uh, character is trying to say, or even in poetry, wh what the narrator is trying to get across. There is no use saying F this and F that, and you know, um, I mean, for so many rant poems, you could actually use these kind of words and get away. But how to write even rant poems without using um, strong words or slogans or um, anything that seems uh, wanton or rant? <laughs> I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, <clears throat> students learning how to turn off the editor. Not the What's F-word editor, but the editor in the sense of writing, uh, you know, using language uh, rather than tamping it down. Um, using the editor as in the, the tool editor? The editor, the, the editor of uh, just the, you know, writing things out first and then going back and editing it later. Oh, okay, that way. Yeah, I think it's an important question, and I'm glad Andrew raised it. Uh, how much do you edit? How much do you go back and edit your work? I'll first say what I do personally. I write something new, and I just leave it around for a while. I'm, I'm uh, very respectful about my own writing, but at the same time, I'm cynical too. I'm quite cynical by nature. So I leave the writing and just say it's almost like, a, like you go do your thing and I then go back to something else. I usually come back to my writing a week or two later, uh, and definitely not earlier, and then try to read it aloud. And we spoke about reading aloud uh, being a part of this creative writing exercise. And then I see how much really makes sense to me, the words, the balance of the words, the cadence, the rhythm, the end words, the, the, N -words, the beginning, what, what stays, what suits, what doesn't. And revisions are important, but how much do you really edit or revise? I think also depends on how much do you uh, make, an, how much impact you make with your writing. In the sense that when you're in a creative writing group and you're lucky to be uh, in a group where you can actually write a verse, sonnet, or a haiku, or a, you know maybe a prose poem, and just share it with your uh, cohorts, right? You can share it with your uh, the other writers, the like-minded people here. So I rely also on feedback a lot. lot. So normally I do a peer review practice in the class. So uh, I give them a theme or a topic. They're free to write any genre they want to. It's like a free exercise where I don't tie them to the genre. But once they've written it up, I have it circulated in the group and uh, take feedback. And after the feedback process is over, and it's tough to do because a lot of students are not used to peer reviewing and uh, not li used to listening back to the critique also. But I think it helps because once you go back and think of the critique, you don't have to follow everything, but some bit of revision uh, after that will definitely come handy. And heavy editing, I mean, there are a lot of people, they do heavy editing, like write down lines and just scratch everything over. Uh, I'm, I really cannot say if it's good or bad, but um, I think it all comes together better if you get feedback in a group. And, and that's why peer reviewing and feedback in a group is more important before you start assuming your writing is golden or your writing is trash, you know? Like, I know people who will just, in the movies you see, right, people write and just throw away many, many pieces of paper. So <laughs> that's one way of doing it. But it's, it's good to, it's, I mean, you're lucky and privileged if you have a good instructor and professor, and if you are able to share in a group. I think you should 
just keep the momentum and do it. And that will actually help you much better than uh, just assuming things for yourself. So I don't know if was that. Yeah. Uh, yeah? Um, I'm sure there are many more questions from the students now. We still have the students' workshop to go through. So I believe that the photographers have already stayed on for a long while and they were booked till 7 and they have to go as well. So okay. we've got a formal session to a close and then the students can do the workshopping. And uh, we have the segment we have that we do at Jinder. Should I ask Dr. Bhattar to do that? Do what? So we have some uh, gifts for you. So